Education, even if followed, are not enough. Pilgrims are needed. Once, as part of our, our plan to make a film based on rivers run through, through it, Bill and I took our producer Mike Hausman and director Richard Pierce on a location scouting expedition with Norman. We came to where the Clearwater River flows into the Big Blackfoot and were snapping photos of a great rock, the Clearwater swirling around it. We were picturing Paul shadow casting. A young couple came striding up the bank, wicker creels over their shoulders, rods in hand. In the woman's fishing vest was a familiar paperback. What's that book? Mike asked. The young couple were high school teachers from Colorado. They were retracing the fishing spots in Norman's story. Would you like to meet the author? asked Mike. Some pilgrims are not so literate. One July evening, I decided to try my hand with the new fly rod my fisherman son Eric gave me for my birthday. Bill and I headed for the fishing spot where Norman had described his last expedition with Paul. Bill had fished, fished that, own wa that water with his own brother, and it was the salmon fly hole where my young family had picnicked nearly 20 years before. We walked through the woods toward a sandbar. Long-stemmed daisies and yellow buttercups glowed in the leafy light. At the head of the hole, a young man stood with his left arm around a woman. His right arm moved rhythmically forward and back as he cast a line into the river. Both figures were buck naked. I wanted to stand in the shadows and watch, wanted to see if a red coffee can full of worms lay at the man's feet like the one Jesse's naked, drunk, and sunburned brother Neil used in a river runs through it. Bill pulled me away. The sweet, acrid odor of decaying cottonwood leaves reminded me of days when I walked the Blackfoot with Dave Smith and Dick Hugo and Norman McLean, all of them gone. Bill stooped to pick up a soggy wallet with a driver's license and a man's picture dated three years before. We had visions of death on the river and love at the same moment. Connecting with a river means learning to float. You think you know where you're going, and then you encounter an unexpected turn, a current, or flood. You are swept under. You emerge transformed by the act of surviving danger. The river hides rocks and deep snags and drowned creatures, and it is this secrecy that draws me the tension between what's on the surface and what lies beneath. I believe we are more like rivers than we are like meadows. Floating on my back down the Blackfoot on a dog day in August, I like to point my toes downstream and look up to cliffs and clouds. A red-tailed hawk sails above me. I float past silver-plumed willows. Blue dragonflies hover above a riffle. A kingfisher with his crested, outsized head dives for a minnow. Immersed in liquid light, I find relief from self and time. Each of us has memories we sing over and over again, like a song in our inner ear. If your place of memory and connection is the big Blackfoot River, you are blessed as I am. You will want to do what you can to save the river so your grandchildren can float its green waters and fish its native cutthroats and bull trout. You will teach them to dive into deep pools, touch stones that go back to the beginnings of time. The river is not dead yet. Boys and girls should make love on its banks. Thank you. Well, uh, what we thought we would do is just uh, have a few, a few questions, and I hope that you have some, um, any questions that you'd like to ask. Um, but I, I thought I would, I would start by, um, I'll let Anik get a little settled here. Is that working? Yes. Okay. Um, I thought I would start by asking you about your childhood in that, in that photography studio, around <laughs> all those artists. Um, just talk a little bit about that. How do you think that has influenced your life as an artist? Well, I'm sure it has influenced my life. Uh, 
because uh, I grew up amidst artists, people and people who were creating uh, at least commercial art, if not really beautiful art. Um, and it seemed like a ordinary, normal thing to do. It's so different from, say, Bill Kittredge, who grew up, you know, on a ranch. As a, there was not an artist in sight, except for maybe framed um, prints of Charlie Russell paintings. So, um, so it seemed like a, it didn't seem like a big jump to think that. Except I was quite shy and self-conscious, and uh, after uh, puberty, I didn't think I had any kind of power of creativity at all. And so I wanted to be a oh, scholar, and I wanted to be in the State Department, and I ended up being an editor. And being an editor taught me a lot about writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I got interested in film and, and went that direction. And then after I hooked up with Bill, well, I started to try and write poems when I was friends with Dick Hugo um, and found that I could write some poems and I could get them published, but that I really didn't have it in me to go back and really, really become a poet because I knew the kind of work that would take and I, I was already in middle age with four children and a dead husband and, you know, I, I needed, I couldn't go back and learn to be a poet. So I thought, I'll write prose. <laughs> I can do that. And, and Bill really helped me uh, figure out how to do that. Um, as I was, you know, preparing for your arrival, I was thinking about how much of your work is driven by collaboration. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, I've thought a lot about this because um, I watched this show, Project Runway, and, the, and there, are, there are these clothing designers, and there are these fabulous designers, and they're the ones who get knocked out because there are these collaborative challenges mm -hmm. on certain weeks, and they, can, they can't collaborate. They can work on their own as brilliant people, but they can't really collaborate with other people. Do you think that you, uh, is that something that you've, um, learned how to do, or do you think the collaborative impulse is just something you I think that's do? something that I'm really kind of skitzy. Uh -huh. um, that there's a part of me which is really social, really collaborative. I love working with other people. I work, and that's part of the environmental work, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. It's politi political. It's uh, all that, that kind of energy. And then uh, you get really tired doing that. And then I just want to be a hermit, <laughs> uh -huh. and then I want to just go hide out with my aunt, with my dogs and uh, and take long walks and and type on my computer, and that's all I really want to do. Mm -hmm. So, though there are those two parts, and they have, you know, lived. One takes precedent in some parts of my life, and others other parts. So, mm -hmm. I know it's I know it, I'm split that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your and your new book. Um, it's not called Travels with Bruno, it's called... Crossing the Plains, Crossing with, the Bruno. plains with Bruno. What's the status on that book? How, how far along is I'm it? I'm doing my like fourth rewrite, mm -hmm. um, and I'm about a third of the way through, and I'm making it... It's, it's, a, it's a story about me going from Montana and taking side roads across the plains with my chocolate lab, Bruno, to visit my 97-year-old mother in Chicago and then take her to our summer home. And so it's a travel book, it's a dog book, and it's a memoir. And it's becoming more a memoir and less travel mm -hmm. as I revise it. Are dogs good traveling companions? Well, my dog is. <laughs> <laughs> Bruni is. Bruno is the best. <laughs> He's the best traveling companion I ever had. <laughs> He's lots of fun to do things with, and he never asks you for anything. <laughs> I wonder, well, let's open it up to questions. Does anyone have something they'd like to uh, ask on? Joe, go ahead. Yes, you mentioned your experience in the Northeast Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Just mentioned it briefly. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I, I sort of went into it uh, with a blank head, a blank page. I, I didn't quite know what to expect. And um, I, I, I was overwhelmed with the, uh, with, the, with the richness of that tall grass prairie. 
And uh, then I began to learn its parts. You know, I began to learn about the grasses and about the soils and about the trees and then about the history, about the ranch that, I, that this preserve was on. And, and then going back to the horrible oil, I mean the oil history of that area, which was a, a real horror story as far as the Osage Indians were concerned. And, uh, and then before that, you know, to the days when the Indians used it as a hunting ground. And, and before that, to the geology, to the glaciers, and so on. And it was just a great journey of discovery for me. And I worked with very good people, the, the, uh, the non Nature Conservancy, the Oklahoma Nature Conservancy, uh, especially a group of women there were instrumental in getting the money to finance this project. And then the National Nature Conservancy was really helpful and, and great. And, um, and I worked with a wonderful publisher and artists who put together a tremendous uh, compilation of historic photographs and contemporary wildlife photographs that are all in that book. And then much to my everyone's surprise, it sold out. I don't think there are any copies. They printed 10,000 copies. I don't think there's any left except maybe on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, it was a really lear a strong and good positive learning experience. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, that be and there's tremendous richness here. I mean, well, somebody can start. <laughs> there's no no one to stop you. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a wonderful idea to deal to deal with place in that kind of depth. I, I and it's almost any place can have that same kind of uh, look. I think I saw on Amazon that that book is, uh, there's a copy for sale on Amazon for $150 or something. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I saw that. Yeah. There's a question over here. Yes. Uh, you spoke a little bit about your collaborative process, uh, and also you were speaking, uh, you mentioned something about uh, Mr. Redford mm -hmm. choosing to shoot the film not on the river. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think if I'd had, you know, if I'd had the power, if I'd had the rights, um, I would have shot it on the Blackfoot, um, and it would have been a different film, and it probably would not have been as popular. It would have been a darker film, like the book is a darker is a darker story than what comes across in the film. The film is lovely, and beautiful, and fun, but uh, I think if Bill and I had done it with uh, the director Dick Pierce um, and Norman it would have been closer to the book and it would have been uh, therefore a little bit darker and a little bit deeper and a little bit less of a boy story. And it would have been on the Blackfoot and Norman would have been in it. Our idea was to have the voice at the beginning and the end be Norman. And he had this little kind of hat that he wore, a little wool hat and jacket and we wanted to show him fishing uh, in sort of silhouette at the beginning and at the end. But you know, some things work and some things don't work. And Bill and I basically sold our rights to Robert Redford, and he was in charge, and we were not. Other questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. Black foot. Lewis and Clark uh, went up that valley, I think, didn't they? Lewis did. Lewis did going home. Lewis did going home. And then he went over, over the Continental Divide at Rogers Pass and into eastern, into, toward Great Falls, uh, up that way. And then the other question is, uh, how long did you become acquainted with the nature Oh, it like, seems like the Nature Conservancy has been in my world ever since I've been in the West. Um, how did we... I'm not sure how I got... I think probably through efforts in the, to preserve the Blackfoot in the first place, because they were working very hard uh, with landowners to get 
land easements, conservation easements. And 80s. 80s. The Prairie Book was with Paulette Millichap at uh, Council Oaks. She called you and wanted you to write the book, and Bill didn't want to write it. And uh, that's the real story. <laughs> she called Bill and wanted him to write it, and he, you know, for $25,000, and he wouldn't do it. And I said, boy, I need $25,000. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> and, they, and so then we went through this whole vetting process, and I sent in samples, and I went down to Oklahoma, and they met me. And, and they all thought that was fine. And it's ironic when you talk about the Nature Conservancy, which did fund that book, um, because it's their preserve, um, that um, it was dedicated to a guy whose name, I forgot his first name, Williams. He was a big oil man in uh, Oklahoma, a big oil uh, pipeline guy, big Williams buildings in downtown Tulsa. And his son, Jamie, uh, was uh, working for the Nature Conservancy, and Bill knew him from Colorado, and his wife was one of Bill's students and was the college roommate of my niece, and then he turned out to be the head of the Nature Conservancy in Montana. So, this, you know, the West is small. <laughs> you get to know a lot of people, because um, there's lots of space, but not that many people, and, and when you start knowing everybody after a while. I am very thankful for editors. Uh, I think editors can help you tremendously because after a certain point you really become blind to what you're doing. And you need good readers, you need good editors. And having been an editor, I worked at a university press, at the University of Washington Press, and then I did freelance editing. And it really sharpens, you know, your sense of, of a sentence, of what can stay, what is superfluous. Um, and, uh, and that was a discipline that helped me. Filmmaking also helps. It's another reduct, you know, you have to really be very, very spare in a, in a screenplay, uh, in imagining a, a film. And so then when you go into fiction or nonfiction into a, a, a prose, it seems like you're just set free. And, uh, but that discipline is still there in the back of your head and in your ear. Um, so I think editor, it helps to have edited. I don't think it's necessarily the same skill set. That uh, a good editor is not necessarily a good writer. Uh, although maybe good writers would be good editors. Because they have an eye for how things should work. Does that answer you? I think so. <laughs> okay. I think we have time for one more question, if somebody's really... Go ahead. I have so many questions. <laughs> well, and I should say that those of you who want to go to the 8 o'clock event can go, and Anik will sign books, and we have lots of suites over there, so I hope we stay and talk. So. Oh, great. Uh -huh. um, so the first question is how close you are. And then next question is, I'm planning, I work for a conservation agency. Uh -huh. I went planning a river float this summer. Mm -hmm. And your, what you said about connecting with the river uh, means learning to float. Mm -hmm. I get that. I get that. And within this river float cleanup, I'm trying to figure out how to connect people with, like, physically taking the stuff out of the river. And we've got music and we've got art now and thinking about readings and writing. Do you have a reading or a writing or a saying or a quote that might help you help people connect with the river with the quote? Well, first of all, I live about uh, I don't know, sixty miles from the Selway Bitter Bitterroot. Is 
that about right, Bill? Yeah. I live up the Blackfoot, and that's down the Bitterroot. So it's 60 to 100 miles to the, you know, if you're going to get into the top, it's a ways. Um, there's many, many uh, wonderful things that you can, in literature, that you can use about rivers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I could, I mean, start with a river runs through it. Uh, J Jim Harrison, James Harrison, the poet, has wonderful, a, a book about uh, river poems. Um, more, ri I mean, you could just go on endlessly talking about that. Um, do, you, do you want what my favorite river thing is? <laughs> Well, I think it's Norman MacLean. I think it's it's the end, I mean, the last paragraph, paragraph, the last phrase in Norman's book is about as good as you get. Now, if she's not writing a river book. She wants to quote, use it to teach children oh, okay. who she's taking on a float. One of the things you see if you're in this business is you see river book after river book after river book. After river book. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's for, a, yeah, you don't want to write the same book, but, you know, there's a reason. There's a reason there are lots of river books. Mm -hmm. It's so archetypal, and everyone tries their hand at, at, at those archetypal themes. Well, we're, we really are out of time, so please stay, and um, Anik will sign books, and uh, please join me in thanking Anik for being so generous. <laughs>